heart. I said, it's hardwired to give and experience and receive forgiveness. That's what I want to talk about today. I want to ask you three questions this morning before we kick off. Here's my three questions. I'm going to read a little bit today, so sorry about that. I'll just talk like a normal would. Here's the first question. Do you want 2019 to be a year in which you can demonstrate God's love to others? All right? Do you want that to be a year in which you demonstrate God's love to others, in which they will really be impacted? So I'm going to share with you some keys today that I think will help you to do that. Second question is, do you want 2019 to be a year in which you grow as a person? Now, I don't mean kind of like that, all right? Grow and develop as a person uh, and to be generous, to learn to live by faith in God. So I'm going to share you some keys about that as well. And the third question, so the first question was, do you just want to demonstrate God's love to others? Do you want to grow as an individual? And the third question is this, do you want to live in a place of freedom, not just freedom church, but to be in a place of freedom yourself, rather than a place where you're always playing catch up, you're always thinking, hey, if only I had this, if only I had something else. I'm going to share you some keys that I think will do all of those things. And foundational to all of those things is one thing. Today, this is a powerful message for you, and that's actually to live with that attitude of forgiveness. The same expression that Jesus had on the cross where he said, You know what, Father, forgive them, tells us there's something in us that, as we said, we're hardwired to receive and, and give forgiveness. And then he also set for us a powerful example of how we should live with others. All right, here we do. This is where it gets a bit risky on my part. I'm going to pull something out of my pocket here. Okay. So let's just show, I've got some small amount of money here, $10. I just can put on this side, I don't know your name, I'm sorry. Are you, are you a trustworthy person? We'll, we'll find out, I guess. <laughs> uh, I put my $10 there, and if I come back in a little while and find it's gone, So my assumption is that I get it. Truly. So what I do now and how I react now, I have a choice to act out of what Thomas was talking about before, about this sort of the worldly understanding, our natural carnal way of thinking, or do I act with a sense of, of a life of forgiveness? All right? So we'll come back to I know where it is, right? I know where it is, sorry. I, I, I remember. Okay? Um, but we, we'll, we'll come back to that in a little while. But before we do that, I want to make some, I want to make some predictions. I'm not a prophet. I want to make some 2019 predictions. Here we go. In 2019, some of these things will happen to you. You will have the opportunity to offer and to receive forgiveness. Right? Probably, what, what are we up to now? The 6th or 7th or 6th, I think, today of January? Jazz is You probably had that chance already. Uh, to do so. You will have the opportunity in 2019 to offer forgiveness to somebody else and to receive forgiveness from somebody else. You will bump into somebody, you will hurt someone, you will disappoint someone, you will upset someone, you will owe someone, you will disagree with someone. Okay? If that hasn't happened or it doesn't happen in this 2019, then Thomas does good funerals, I understand. So, okay. But the other side of that is that someone's going to bump into you. Someone's going to hurt you. Someone's going to owe you. Some, someone's going to disappoint you. They're going to disagree with you. The list will go on. It will just happen because it's part of the broken world in which we live. Does it mean we're bad people? Not necessarily. It's just a consequence of the world in which we are in. So the advantage that we have today is we can help prepare ourselves for 2019 when those things are almost certain to happen. So how, what attitude do we take in? I asked you earlier, the first question was, do you want 2019 to be a year in which you demonstrate God's love to others in which they really, in the way in which they really sit up and take notice? And I believe that receiving and offering forgiveness is really a key to that. But you need to understand something. The reason we offer and receive forgiveness is usually not so much for the other person's benefit, but it's actually for our benefit. For our benefit. If, if I'm... 
doing something, I'm, I'm going to Lee and I'm saying, I, I, I forgive him of something or I, I ask for his forgiveness and I, I'm doing so to, to change him or do something in him. That's called manipulation. It's actually a little, little dishonest and a little bit uh, disingenuous. Does that understand what I mean by that? I'm actually not acting all that touristically. If I come to him and I ask his forgiveness because I think I might have reached some sense of trust or I need or, or I offer his, my forgiveness to him, I do so because actually that's going to benefit me and make a change in me. It may make a change in him as well. But the principal reason for doing this is because I need to receive forgiveness and I need to offer forgiveness. Otherwise, then what happens in me depends upon his response. But actually, there's something in me that says, you know what, I want to offer forgiveness to him. I, want to, I need his forgiveness. And then that may or may not change him. That's because forgiveness is an act of faith. You see, if I, if I come to, to Lee and uh, I feel that he's upset me with something, uh, and uh, I, I go to him and I, I say, you know what, Lee, um, uh, you've, you've done this thing, mate. You've, you've done this thing that has really hurt me. Um, and then there's a chance that he may go out and, uh, and go on social media and, and post that to all his friends. Well, what, a, what a jerk God is. He's, he's so, so silly. He comes to me and he says these little things. He's so weak. He's big, you know, wussy that he is. What does that kind of say in the church for us? Um, and and he, he, can, he can act up on that. He can go and tell everybody, hey, you know, Rod, Rod responded this way, Rod responded that way. And I'm going to come to him in an act of faith. I'm actually putting myself out there a little bit. Um, and... Um, and just saying, you know, I'm coming to you in honesty and trust me that you're going to respond and, and, and do with my heart in an appropriate way. Um, I don't know how he's going to respond. But I come to him in faith. That's why asking and seeking forgiveness is actually an act of faith. To respond to that conviction from God to do that. Which reminds me a little bit of a verse that's in the Bible, one of my favourite verses. Actually, I was at a baptism ceremony just last weekend and a young child actually read it out. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. It says, God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I kind of like that. Um, an older, older version, language version of that. It says, God commended his love to us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, God put his love out there in advance. He commended, he put it forward to us. It was actually an act of faith on his part. He's the author of faith. And then it's up to us as to how we respond. Well, to me, forgiveness is a little bit like that. I actually, I'm going to commend forgiveness to you. I'm going to offer forgiveness to you. I'm actually going to put myself out there in a sense of vulnerability and trust. Learning to do that, to, to respond in forgiveness like that is as an act of faith. That's pleases, pleases God because faith pleases God. Doesn't mean to say it's easy. So here's the key issues here. If you've wronged somebody else, then seek forgiveness. If you feel you've been wronged by another, then offer forgiveness because they are powerful tools for blessing. I mentioned earlier that on the cross, Jesus says, Father, forgive them. Just imagine that you were standing there that day at the cross and maybe you're a Roman soldier or maybe you're a disciple and and uh, you know, alternating a little bit in terms of your, your belief and, and your fear at that particular time, you hear those words, Father, forgive them. I know for me it would have just, just come deep into my heart. Not, not out of a sense of attack, but out of a sense of love and glorying of his, of his spirit. It's like, come on, Rodney, come on, there's still hope for you, there's still hope for you. And even today, just hear that, hear that verse. You know, you look back at 2018 and say, you look back at 2018 now, our our default position is we look back and we think of all the bad things and mistakes of 2018. Just say, you know what? Today I want to hear his voice saying, Father, forgive me. Forgive me, Father, for those sins. And today I want to hear your voice. I forgive you. And I just want to move on with confidence and with, with a sense of, of optimism for what 2019 will bring. Well, will bring because I've been hardwired for forgiveness. I asked you before whether you want 2019 to be a year in which you grow as a person in, in generosity and in, and in love and compassion. Um, Pastor Lynette Tobin, some of you may know, is a good friend of ours. And she would always 
just about every Sunday as you would say these words from Proverbs chapter 11, 23, 24, 25, the world of a generous person gets larger and larger. And, and learning how to be generous, actually that's what forgiveness is. You know, if Lee has done something wrong to me and I extend to him forgiveness, I'm actually being generous to him. I, I, and, and if I'm being generous to him, then the word of God says that something about my world is going to get larger. Does it mean I'm going to get fatter? No, I hope not. What it means is going to, there's some security that's going to come from being generous, from giving away. The world standard says, hang on a minute, if I give away, I'm going to have less. Well, the Word of God says, you know what, if I give away, if I give that offer of voluntary forgiveness, something in me gets bigger. And my experience is that something in Lee will get bigger. Do you mind me picking on you today? I'm not a bit like now to ask your forgiveness, but I will. And hopefully you'll forgive me. If not, maybe by the end of today. If not, we can have a little chat. <laughs> but we do need to really think the world's mindset. That's so easy comes into us. It says we're actually better if we hold on to stuff. The kingdom principle says, no, no, that's not the way it works. If you want to grow as a person, let it go. The, 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 the world thinking of generosity is that you can be generous if you have much. But the, the kingdom principle is generosity does not relate to how much we have, but it relates to an attitude of mind and, and a sense of who we are in Christ. And that therefore, the ones who are most generous are those actually who have least and who give. Jesus taught that way all the time. As a consequence of that, then, generosity and offering forgiveness, actually, we expect it's going to hurt a little bit. You know, if somebody steals $10 from me, that hurts. But if I offer forgiveness, that will hurt a little bit too, because then I probably have released my chance of getting my $10 back. I don't necessarily put it in the bank quite yet. Right? I, actually, so it's going to, forgiving actually will hurt. You sort of think, well then, that can't be very biblical. Well, ask Jesus whether it's biblical or not. Okay, so Jesus is on the cross. And he's forgiving the people that are hurting him. And in the kingdom way, that's okay. Because there's a higher principle. He said, just, there's a higher position. So you know what, it's actually just not about what's happening now, in the here and now. There's another, big, big bigger principle at work. So people who forgive are acting generously. And therefore, they expand in their influence and in their grace. For many years, Gigi and I have had a practice um, of opening our home to people who need somewhere to stay. Um, and uh, we actually got a little house now, so we have to rethink that strategy a little bit. But, uh, yeah, there's a couch for them. Or for them. <laughs> well, there's been times when it's been a bit like that, actually. You know, we, we gave up our master bedroom and our. Uh, and our, um, our ensuite and everything else for a couple that are going to stay for, I think, a month and I stayed for two and a half years. And, you know, and there's others who stayed for just a few days and some who stayed for years. And in, in that time of, of doing that, there were people who came and stayed at our house whom it was just so easy. And some people who stayed at our house who actually were quite well off and had a, a lot of resources. And there were others who stayed at our house who literally had nothing. And some of them, because of the history of, of perhaps abuse or of dysfunction, living with them in a home was not particularly easy. And in, in our house, sometimes it was not particularly easy. So if you want to learn how to grow in forgiveness, sharing your stuff is a great way to experience it. Being married is a great way to experience it. Just whenever you're in a shared situation, all of a sudden, the sense of boundaries that we like to keep around ourselves, just, I was saying they get under attack, they get fuzzy. They, and in each of those experiences is a chance to grow as a person. And say, so, you know what, can I offer forgiveness in this situation? Or am I all about protecting my stuff? Hey, after all, the world of the generous person gets larger and larger. So God help me to grow through this situation. And let me tell you, there's been some times when we've grown. And I reckon there's been a few times in sharing our house where we've probably helped some other people grow as well. 
And some of them are probably standing up in some churches this Sunday morning around the country saying, oh man, we stayed with this couple and it was really hard. We kind of tend to have this tendency to sort of look at ourselves and everybody hurts us and we don't hurt anybody. But there's always these interactions that go on. So if you want to experiment with forgiveness, then share your stuff. Share your car. Share your resources. Share your home if it's appropriate to do so. I'm not suggesting that anybody makes themselves unsafe or, or whatever else. But, um, open yourself up a little bit and take a kingdom point of view. Just a point of clarification though about that is what I'm not condoning is if, if somebody's being beaten or somebody's being in, a, in an abusive situation that they necessarily stay there and continue to to experience that abuse. Actually, that's not necessarily forgiveness. Forgiveness is when I release somebody from my judgment of them. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily mean I need to stay in the same position and cop the same treatment again and again and again. So if you're in an abusive situation, you don't need to stay there to, to experience and, and offer forgiveness. You can get out of that situation, but you can still forgive. You can release that person from your judgment. So you know what? But, however, a consequence of that person's relationship or of their behaviour means that I'm not necessarily going to associate myself with that person at the moment until they change their behaviour. Do you understand what I mean? So please don't say that I'm, I'm hearing uh, you know, that, that people need to stay in abusive situations. I'm not saying that at all. It's actually about the state of the heart. The third thing that I asked you was, uh, did you want 2019 to be a year of freedom? I certainly do. I certainly do. So I don't want to be playing catch up. I want to live by grace. You know what, in the Bible, uh, I think I told this story once before uh, in, in this church about Shishi and I were in a holiday in, in Phuket. I think, uh, anybody remember the story about the firecrackers? No, it probably means I, I didn't tell it or maybe I told it and you didn't, you weren't listening. I don't know. We'll, we'll just assume it's the first one of those, hey? And if it wasn't, then I'll forgive you. I have to today. Uh, so, so we, we were in, in, in Phuket on, having a holiday we were on a little cruise and our 20, 25th wedding anniversary, which was kind of fun. And, and we, we went to this. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> is that wrong, Thomas? Okay. That's your firecracker. That's my firecracker. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, we, we went, you know how they do these tours and they take you to churches and temples and stuff. But we didn't really want to go into this particular temple, so we just stood outside walking around the gardens. And while we were there, we heard these little firecrackers going off, you know, little like kind of tom thumbs, I think they used to be called, bang, 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 you know, not, not sky shows sort of stuff. And we thought, well, that's interesting. So we're just standing, and there's this half, I think they called it, it was like a, a fireplace, maybe yay big. And, um, and in there was this, was this person, this, this woman, was throwing these firecrackers in, and somebody explained to us that in their particular religion, uh, they, they do this, and this was the way in which their kind of sins could be covered over and they could be, they could be forgiven. It's interesting. I didn't know about the firecrackers thing before. Um, and then about 10 minutes later, as we were just standing there, on the other side of this open garden area, there was another person who came along to another half, and, and he was setting off his firecrackers, and his were like 10 times bigger than hers. And it was just like bang, 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 bang. You know, it was unbelievable. And I was there thinking, first of all, the first thought was he must have seen a whole lot. But then the second thought was, <laughs> I wonder what that poor woman is feeling now. Did she feel that her firecrackers were enough to cover them over for her sin? Or did she need that big amount of firecrackers for her sin? And then I thought, I'm so grateful to Jesus that he has done everything that we need to be forgiven. And there's nothing more that I need to do. And all the way through scripture, we just get this message that it's actually our salvation is the response to God's free gift of grace that we receive by faith. Yeah? But, speckled through scripture is another narrative that says, not that there's something else that we need to do to earn our salvation. Jesus has done everything that, we need, that needed to be done. But there's something that we need to do in response to our salvation, and that is to forgive. And one of the toughest passages of scripture about forgiveness is found in Matthew chapter 18. And it's one that we don't often preach about because it's not particularly nice to hear. I'm going to preach about it, and visiting preachers can do that because you know they don't have to be around the following week and fix up the mess. But in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus is talking about forgiveness, and he tells a story, not not, a, not, not, not an account, but he actually tells a fictitious story, a parable, 
about a guy who was a servant to the king. And he owed this king a tremendous amount of money. And when time came to be reconciled and, and to pay that money up, he couldn't pay. So he went to the king and he begged for more time. And the king was gracious and merciful to him. And as a consequence, what he did, the king said, I'll tell you what, you don't have to pay me at all. I actually release you of that debt. So this person went out not owing anything to the king. This debt that he could never repay. But then what he did was he went and found one of his fellow servants. And he said, hey, you owe me this amount of money. And that amount of money was, was more than the guy could pay in a hurry. But he asked, so this guy asked for more time with this, this fellow servant. And, and our man said, no, I'm going to sue you. I'm going to lock you up in jail until such time as you can repay me. Now, the logic of that always kind of does my head in because how somebody's going to repay when they're locked up in jail, I don't know. But that was his response. He, he had received this great forgiveness. And then he's gone to his brother, or his, his fellow servant, and said, hey, you owe me this money, pay up now, I'm going to lock you up in jail. Anyway, the king found out about this, and the king was really upset. It's Jesus is telling the story. And he says, you know what the king did? He, he grabbed this guy, and he says, hey, you should have shown mercy. Because I showed mercy to you, you should have shown mercy to your fellow servant. So what I'm going to, I'm actually going to get you and float, throw you into jail until you can repay me all the stuff that I just forgave you from. Now Jesus said these really tough words. Words that sometimes we don't like to hear. And he says, you wicked servant. Sorry, big pardon. This is how your heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother and sister from your heart. So Jesus makes it really clear. Sometimes the disciples were left to work out the meaning of the parable all by themselves. And this one, he wasn't taking any chances. He says, I want you to understand something. This is how your heavenly father views your responsibility to forgive if you've been forgiven. You think, about this time I will have a glass of water. Because that's, um, that's, that's tough words. That is really tough. There is an expectation on us, if we have received his forgiveness, to forgive others. Jesus is saying, if something, if you're not showing that, it says that something in you haven't really embraced, you haven't really understood the power of the forgiveness that you've been given. So we're left shocked by those words. And jolted into the understanding that we who have been forgiven have in our hands a tremendous opportunity to give or to withhold the blessing of forgiveness. Gigi and I have known adults who, um, uh, about our age, have lived in multiple homes around the state. And, um, and everywhere they live, they seem to have a run-in with their neighbours. They run-in, you know what I mean, like dispute with their neighbours. You know, the, the neighbour did that, or the neighbour did this, or the, the reticulation did that, or the driveway did this, or... And we sort of think, well, okay, that's pretty tough. And then they've gone to another house, and the same thing happened again. And they've gone to another house, six or seven houses in a row. There's a pattern beginning to form. And what happens then is that they start to almost, I wish I had a pair of dark glasses here today, you know, almost look at, look at things, everything that that neighbour does becomes bad, becomes wrong. Every action that they've done, there's some, some double meaning, some, some trickery, something behind it. And it becomes a state of mind for them. You know what, I actually think that you can practice forgiveness. You can practice having a different mindset. Even people who are entrenched in the situation wanting to blame their neighbour and blame somebody else, you can actually stop that and get a different mindset and say, hang on, it's time in 2019 to think differently and to exercise forgiveness. Not only so that I can change, but so that they can change as well. I want to take off those dark glasses. I remember that the money is still over there too. Jesus gave us lots of strategies. In that Matthew chapter 18, he talked about what happens if somebody does do something wrong. If somebody does steal $10 from you, how should you respond? 
He doesn't say you should post it on social media so that all the world and all your friends feel sorry for you. I guess Jesus knew there would be such a thing as social media, but he didn't say that. Does anybody remember what he did say? What's the first thing you should do? Go to go and talk to that person. So I'm going to just try and have a quiet chat. I hope I'm not going to get any feedback here. Two of us, nobody else will hear. Okay? So it says the first thing we should do is we should go to that person. Just you and that person. Just by yourself. Not anybody else. Not trying to get a whole bunch of people to get up on your side. Because it's actually not about taking sides. It's actually about winning a brother or winning a sister. Shishi and I often say it's better to win a brother or a sister than to win an argument. So Zoe and I just have a chat and we say, Zoe, I think you've got ten dollars that actually belongs to me. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm feeling kind of a bit hurt about that because it's actually my ten dollars. So would you give it back to me? And if she says yes, not only have I got my ten dollars back, but I've won a f I have will not met Sally before as I before to my or oh, oh, Sally, both of them. Um, for that matter. <laughs> Two for the price of one. So I've won a sister. Okay? I'm Rodney, by the way. I'm, I'm okay. Which is great. So I actually end up, I am richer now, not just because I've got my $10 back, because I've actually won a friend. I know you live in Melbourne, it's a long way away. Maybe I'll come to visit one day. All right. Um, what if, I'm just going to give it back to you again. What if she said, no, I'm not giving you your $10 back? It was, it was given to me by my sister. Then what I might want to do is follow Jesus' step number two. So the first thing you do is you take, take a friend with you and uh, see if you can resolve it. And if you do, you want a brother or your sister. Then, if you don't, then take a friend with you. So, mum, that, that's I'm pulling with the big guns here. Mum, mum, do you want to eat? No, no, sorry. So I bring a friend. And in the presence of a witness, then I try and resolve this. Notice that the intention of this conversation is not about the $10. It's actually about building trust. Because there's something about trust that is broken down between the two of us. The cause of the trust is the $10. But I'm actually wanting to rebuild the relationship. So in the presence of you, I just ask you again about that money. And, and maybe then you might change your mind and say, you know what, Robert, just pick it up off there. It actually is yours. Or she might say, actually, no. No, it's mine. I found it in my stories for girls' book. Or maybe she picked it up off the ground. Didn't even know it was mine because the wind had blown it from the fan. I don't know. So then Jesus says, you know, but if that doesn't work, then what you do is you take it to the next level and you tell it to the church. And I'm standing up at the church and I say, you know what, I, I think I had $10 there and, and, uh, and then I, I think that Zoe just grabbed it. Um, and my wife, you're going to stand there saying, you know what, Rod, you're wrong. You said she could take it. Is that right? I think you all thought. So, take it, take it. Okay? So you actually might, might feed back to me, or you may say, you know what, yes, she did take it, and it wasn't hers to keep. Yeah. And Jesus says quite an amazing thing. He doesn't say, therefore, if the person doesn't respond even after you talk to the church about it, then you hate that person, or you rant about that person, or you badmouth that person. He says, you treat that person like you would an outsider or an unbeliever. Why well, do you treat an outsider or an unbeliever? You don't hate them. You love them, you forgive them, you don't necessarily hang out with them all day long, you don't necessarily ex expose yourself to that level of trust with them, but you do want to be in a relationship with them if you can. You do love them, you do do the things that Jesus said you should do. So it's not a case of now, I hate you and I will never ever talk to you again. It's a case of, you know what? I might have lost 10 bucks. At the end of the day, is it the end of the world? No. Can I go to the Father and say, Father, help me? Resource me, bless me, yeah. but you know what? Bless Zoe too, and, and just help her as she walks through her own challenges. So that's the passages that Jesus set out. Try and win a friend first. Take a friend with you. Talk to the church if you need to. And if that doesn't work, and that's unusual that you get to that level, 
then just, just put some distance between yourself and that person. But continue to pray for them and hope that one day they may respond to your kindness and openness. Because that's what Jesus did for us. How many times in 2018 did the Holy Spirit whisper on my door and say, Rodney, I want you to do this and that, and I was slow to respond. Many times. Too many times that I care to remember or imagine. How many times would the same thing have happened to you? Perhaps once or twice. But still he loved us. Still he continued to comfort us. Still he has a plan and purpose for our lives. He doesn't give up on us. Perhaps today you hear that same whisper. The whisper that says, I forgive you. A whisper that might say, you know what, you need to approach that person and ask for forgiveness. Or seek forgiveness. Or talk to them gently one on one. You know, one of the things, one of the things I hate, I don't want to tell a story, but I will. I know there's, there's kids here, and for some people this is a tough story, but um, one of the things that, that I hate is being in the family court and seeing couples who one day stood and, and made promises to each other. Now, at, at, at the encouragement of their legal teams, doing all they can to find points of difference and fault from one from the other. It just breaks my heart. And I sort of think, I don't want to be like that. I don't want the focus to be on points of difference. I actually want when there's challenges in relationships and there will be, I want the focus to be on how can I rebuild that relationship. Even if it means I've got to look past some stuff. How do I take that hurt, offer it up to the Father and say, Father, I'm hurting, will you please help me heal me? And now with a clear head, be able to go into this issue and win a brother, win a sister. So today, the Spirit may be just challenging you and saying, hey, you need to actually talk to somebody about an area of forgiveness. Then I encourage you to do that. Don't wait until January 2020 before you actually do something about that. There's an interesting little bit of passage in the middle of, of Matthew chapter 18 where Jesus says this. Uh, Peter says to him, oh, look, how many times should I forgive? Should I forgive once? Twice? Up to seven times? And Jesus said, no. How about 77 or 70 times 7, depending on which translation you've got? In other words, lots. Lots and lots and lots. Don't let the focus be on that stuff. Do all you can to rebuild a relationship if you possibly can. But then in the middle of that passage, he also says these words. You know, talking about how, how you might win a brother back, he says, what you, what you loose on earth, what you free up, the person you free up on earth is free in heaven. There's something about that action of freeing somebody, releasing them from your judgment that has eternal consequences. And in the same way, if you choose to bind them, and you choose not to release them from your judgment, you, you want to keep them bound, you actually have there's eternal consequences to that. Now, I don't understand all of that, but it's a quite a profound scripture. And I want to be somebody who's about actually releasing people into a place of freedom, especially if that's going to have eternal consequences. And maybe you're feeling the same way. So this morning, maybe the Spirit's just saying to you, you know what? You need to do something about that. Or maybe you need to ask me for forgiveness for a certain thing. Or maybe you need to be bold and just talk to somebody and just say, you know what? I think we've got a damaged and broken relationship. And healing that broken relationship is really important. And I'm going to act in faith and cross the room and have that conversation with you. Maybe a little bit scared, maybe a little bit butterflies in my stomach, but I'm going to do it anyway in faith because the world gets larger and larger. Anybody like that? I know I am. How about we pray together and we'll just make some time here right now for just the Father to talk to us and minister to us. We're not going to to ask people to come up for prayer. There's some things that you may need to do afterwards, then you do those things afterwards, okay? And if you need to talk to somebody else and get some help to do that, then, then do that. But don't, uh, don't let 2019 go past without acting upon what the Spirit is talking to you about. Holy Spirit, I thank you for your wisdom. I thank you that Jesus made it so clear that forgiveness is such a powerful tool to our sense of foundation in yourself. 
I thank you, Jesus, that you gave strategies for us to follow this four-step process. Um, I ask that you would give us the confidence and the strength to be able to do that. Not to make sides, but to make friends. Not to polarise one against the other, but to join together and free people from our judgement with eternal consequences. So Father, today, I pray not only that people would have the boldness to ask for forgiveness, but the grace to offer forgiveness. And as they do so, that Spirit of God, you will just be like the mortar joining two bricks together. And out of what was a fissure, brings healing and strength. So that at the end of the day, this building, this temple, this place of worship is built up rather than pulled down. Ask in your precious name. Amen. All right, guys, so there's some homework for you for 2019. Here's my tip for 2019. Don't wait for December the 29th or something to do it. If the Spirit is whispering, then do it today. And because you've been exceptionally good, you can keep the $10. Well, what do you like there? Oh, you know. seconds and then some of us get so locked up we don't know what to do with it. And you, if you're honest with God you're saying I don't want to do anything about this. But the best first step is to say Lord help me to want to do it. Because that's a miracle all by itself. I'm going to put another timer on for 30 seconds. You don't want to release it. Ask God to help you to do that to get on that path of actually wanting to release it.
there's another 30 seconds. There's another 30 seconds for your last 30 seconds slot and take up your life here um, today. Uh, what am I going to do about it? I'm going to ask Holy Spirit to give you wisdom now and speak to you about what you do about that. Let's we'll start that now. It's got the image of my mind that we come like dams. Damning, holding it up, holding everything. And what's the Spirit of God do? It flows like rivers of living waters. And I don't want to be someone that comes to a community all dammed up, ready to be filled up a bit more with dam and septic water. I want to be a humble person with the gift of repentance to be able to release forgiveness and see the rivers of living water just flow through my life again. If it has, maybe I've been dammed up for a while, but the God is calling us in this moment to release our dams so that the Spirit of God can flow as He wants to through our lives.